good afternoon and thank you all so much for being here. We, the Hispanic Latinx Resource Group, the Center for Identity and Inclusion, the Center for the Study of Race, Politics and Culture, and the University Community Service Center appreciate you for joining us to explore the solidarity, tension, and blending between Black and Latinx communities today. In this discussion, we'll be centering the history of interactions and intersections between Black and Brown communities, how racism, anti-Blackness, and colonialism has shaped those interactions, and the ways in which Black, Afro-Latinx, and Brown people have come together in solidarity to fight against oppression. Panelists will also discuss these relations to date and what takeaways we can collect from the communities as a whole. I'm going to condense a rather long but very relevant quote from the introduction to Gabe Teresa Johnson's 2013 book, Spaces of Conflict, Sound and Solidarity, Music, Race and Spatial Entitlement in Los Angeles. In it, she talks about how news sources more than often pose black and brown communities as distinct communities with an eternally tense, inherently competitive and sometimes mutually violent, end quote, relationship, when they're actually far more examples of mutually meaningful black and brown anti-racist struggles and radical creative um, affiliations, end quote again. The hope for this panel is to add to that discourse and explore more collaboration, solidarity, and inter intersections of black and brown communities. And to lead us in our explorations today, we're so happy to have Alexandra Galvan, Dr. Chinere Osuji, and Carlos Tortolero with us today. Alex Galvan is a native Chicagoan, graduate of the University of Wisconsin-Madison and incoming graduate student at the School for Social, of Social Service Administration. She's passionate about her work at Chicago Hopes for Kids, and she pulls from her experience as a second generation Chicana in her work and her storytelling. Dr. Chinere Osuji is a writer, scholar, activist, and assistant professor of sociology at Rutgers University, Campton. And she's the author of the book, Boundaries of Love, Interracial Marriage and the Meaning of Race, which just came out last year, go buy it, <laughs> um, in which she interviewed black white couples in Brazil and the United States to understand contemporary notions of race and race mixing to these societies. And Carlos Tortolero is the president and founder of the National Museum of Mexican Arts. He has spoken at conferences across the US, Mexico, Argentina, Sweden, France, and his articles have been published worldwide. He is a boss. And we're thrilled that the person with the vision, the person responsible for bringing this whole panel together, the amazing Christina Corrigan will be our moderator today. Christina is a scholar, analyst, collector of information, and aspiring writer. Soon you'll be buying her work too. She currently works at the University of Chicago as a clinical research informa informatics analyst. And I'll now turn your attention to Christina. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Saida, for the introduction. As Saida said, I'm Christina Corrigan. I work in the biological sciences division at the University of Chicago as an informatics analyst. I'm also the chair of the Hispanic and Latinx resource group at the university. Our mission for the group is to build a network and create a welcoming environment for the Latinx community on campus. This virtual event is a part of that work. The inception for this event came from the heartache that I felt watching and participating in the Black Lives Matter protests in May and June and searching for a way that I could use my platform to support the movement. I reached out to the Center for Identity Inclusion and found very willing partners in Candace Hairston, Saida Kevill, Tracy Matthews and Marilyn Willis. Many thanks to them and many others for getting the event off the ground today. Before I start with my many questions, I will present each panelist and give them a couple minutes to introduce themselves directly to you and ask them an introductory question for our discussion today. I will start with Professor Suji. Uh, if you could please share a little bit more about yourself. And then the, the introductory question I have is when we asked you to participate in this discussion, why did you agree? Why did you want to engage with this topic? Wow, thank you for that. So thank you for the lovely introduction um, on everyone. And thanks for having me here. I'm really excited to be here. So um, I am actually originally from Chicago. And so I have a, a lot of my families in Chicago. I went to Whitney Young, for those of you guys out there who are fellow dolphins. Woo -woo. Um, and um, I am a second generation Nigerian, uh, Nigerian American, meaning my parents were immigrants from Nigeria and I was born here in the United States. My, my people are Igbo, that's our um, ethnic group. And unfortunately I don't speak the language, I only speak a little bit like, you know, like maybe I'll get sold for a goat 
if I go went back home to Nigeria, but hopefully not. <laughs> I know the word for goat and evil. But um, so the reason that I was really excited to be a part of this panel is because I think that um, understanding solidarity and how to create greater solidarity is good for our society. We are undergoing a lot of racial and ethnic division in our time right now. And so I think it's really important to understand what are the successful ways to bridge those gaps. Um, I study ethnic and racial boundaries for a living, and I'm really interested in how people bridge over those boundaries, how people can potentially blur or erase those boundaries, but also not just from like an academic standpoint, not just from an intellectual perspective, but also from a real life perspective, how we can create better policy, better activism to so that everybody wins, right? So we can build a better America. No, that's wonderful. And we're so grateful to have you because that's really one of the goals of this event too, is, is furthering that solidarity. So thank you. Uh, Carlos, would you like to follow and share more about yourself and why you wanted to participate in this panel? Oh, Carlos, I'm sorry, you're muted. Not yet. There yes. we go. Oh, you know, I came to the United States when I was three years old, but I'm, you know, Mexican, Mexicano, through and through and through. Um, you know, I founded the museum in 82. We opened our doors in 87. And after, you know, you know, climate change, you know, you know, the issue of racism is, is another concern of, I mean, then it, it is, you know, uh, the next most important concern for the world, including the U.S. And, you know, I'm the oldest person in this room and I can tell you, man, I always hope things are gonna get better. <laughs> and they go up and they go down, they go up and they go down. We've been active in the racism issue from day one our institution. In fact, in 1990, we organized with another African-American organization, a protest against the city of Chicago. They did a show called the Chicago Show and have 92 artists, only five artists, only five artists were part of it. In 96, we sent uh, the Mantu Dance Company of Chicago and ETA, um, you know, which is a uh, theater group in Chicago, both to go see sites, you know, in Mexico, where there is an African influence. In in 2006, we did a show called the African Presence in Mexico, which is still the largest show ever done anywhere on that theme. The show went to 11 other places across the country, and uh, I'm very proud to report that three years ago, the census finally in Mexico. They finally had a category for Afro Mexicanos and they counted 1.2 million. So, race relations is very, very important to me. No, oh, that's great. And you bring a really wonderful historical perspective to the conversation as well. Uh, finally, Alex, uh, can you introduce yourself and share with us what made you decide to participate in this panel? Yeah, once again, thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Alex Galvan. I'm from the southwest side of the city, from the Scottsdale neighborhood. Um, I'm second generation American, so my mom and her seven siblings came to the United States when my mom was two. Um, and so I've gotten to hear a lot about that generation 1.5 that we talk about um, through my mom's experience, and then a lot about um, just experiencing Chicago for the first time or the United States for the first time in the context of race and ethnicity through my grandparents' eyes. Um, one of the reasons that I was really excited about joining this panel is just to bring my perspective as someone who is racially ambiguous, um, who is Latina, but in certain spaces passes for white, um, who speaks English and Spanish, and just the, the way in which um, that aspect of my identity has shaped my experiences academically, socially, professionally, um, and I'm very excited in the exploration of identity in general. Um, I enjoy working with high school students and helping them write their personal statements for college. And in that, a lot of identity is explored. Um, and so similarly, I'm very interested in, you know, looking at how different communities have come together. And I'm very excited to be doing so in this point in time. I think this is a really important conversation for us to be having at this moment. No, that's so fascinating. And I'm so glad to be a part of this panel. I'm already learning things and we've just gotten started. I've this generation 1.5, I, I haven't heard that term before. And suddenly my whole identity makes a lot more sense now. So this is, <laughs> this is wonderful. We're already getting into it. Um, so to start the panel and the questions, I'm interested in the history of the United States, 
the Americas as a region and that of the communities that today we call Black, Latinx, and Afro-Latinx. Our history classes in school focus a lot on the original sin of slavery or the exploitation. What more can we learn about the Black and Latinx communities and the Afro-Latinx community in particular during the founding of our country and the region around us? And uh, why is it important to learn this history when we look at race today? Uh, Professor Asuji, would you like to start us? Sure, no problem. Um, history, of course, is, is very important for understanding our world today. Uh, Mark Twain has that famous quote that history doesn't repeat itself, it just rhymes, right? So it's important to learn from our past as we're moving forward so that we don't make similar mistakes, but also so that we can learn um, strategies that have worked in the past. And so thinking about the beginnings of this country, we often think about um, the first enslaved Africans arriving in 1619, right? In Jamestown, I believe. And I think it's important to recognize that the Spaniards were here long before the British were, right? And that for almost a hundred years before that, um, enslaved Africans were brought to what became the United States, that there are plenty of settlements in Florida that involved enslaved Africans. And so when we think about um, solidarity and working together, this is something that's from the very first presence of Africans, enslaved Africans here. We think about 1526 as really the date in which enslaved Africans arrived in what became Georgia slash South Carolina, historians don't really know. And at that instance, you've got these um, span, you know, conquistadores, right? Like these Spaniards coming with their ships, trying to create their first, you know, colony on the, you know, in what became the United States. And what happened? The Africans revolted. And this is not the story that people like to hear, right? Africans revolted against the Spaniards and they worked against the Spaniards who were in charge. And they united with the other, the, the other sailors that were also Spaniards and of, of other backgrounds, burned the entire settlement down, ran away to indigenous communities. So when we think about solidarity, this is something that African Americans have been doing from the very, very beginning. And it's not necessarily a story that gets told because of white supremacy and Eurocentrism, right? Who wants it, who wants a story that like the first, you know, white settlement, you know, was actually a disaster, right? Nobody wants to hear that because, you know, enslaved Africans like burned their houses down and killed them all. That's not a nice positive story, but I think it's important to remember that solidarity is something that we've always been doing and it's very important. No, that's that's really fascinating. So from the very beginning of our history, there was unity between um, communities and between the, the Spaniards and the, the Africans that were here. That's, um, that's really fascinating. Um, so if we can move forward a little bit, I'm also really curious to hear about um, these communities uh, in Chicago. The Black, Latinx, and Afro-Latinx communities are really strong in Chicago. Um, they're not originally from this, uh, this area. Um, so where are they from? How did they end up in our beautiful city? Uh, Carlos, would you like to, to start us? Oh, we're still, we're Carlos, we're muted again. Oh, Carlos, we, we're, you're on mute. There yeah. we go. Somebody keeps muting me. All right. That's okay. To, to begin with, I want to say that the first, you know, you know, Africans actually came with Spain and went to the Southwest. There was actually an African explorer who was very, very important. And around 300 years, no, not about 250, wait, about, you know, 200 and some 40 years ago, Los Angeles was founded by a group of people from Mexico overwhelmingly Afro-Mexicanos. And that's a story that nobody ever tells. So, 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 so from day one, there, there was always a lot of, uh, you know, contact the group. I think the real problem is when one talks about history, we don't know much about history, you know, and the United States is really a very ignorant country when it comes to knowing about the world. For example, how many United States realize that the 10 largest cities in the United States, it's people of color who are the majority. So we're using terms like, you know, minorities. Whenever with a white funder, white person, I always tell them, how does it feel to be part of the minority and yet you have most of the power? <laughs> Turn the whole thing 
around. So the words we use are very, very important. Um, my community has a problem because we have so many terms to describe ourselves besides, you know, Mexican, Mexicano. We have Latino, Latin, Latinx, Ibero-American, Hispanic, Hispanic American, Latin American, Spanish speaking. It's like too many terms, you know? I also think where I come from, the most important thing is to first always make sure that you maintain your cultural identity. Because if we do not keep that we're Mexican, Cuban, Puerto Rican, we will not survive as a, we will not survive as a culture saying that we're Latino, Latinx, Hispanic, Ibero-American. No, we have to preserve our culture and then work together. Because we have a such a you know you know problem in the sense it's a good problem in the sense. Look at Amy and I. We don't look any way like each other. And do you know there are over a hundred million African descended people in Latin America? way more than the United States. And no one stops to think about that. So we are a diverse group of people. So it's very important for us to make sure that we maintain our culture. In Chicago, 80% of all Latinos, Mexican. United States, it's about 63%. That's very important to know these, these facts. And why do people come here? For jobs. The average Mexican, if he can stay in Mexico and earn a third of what he makes here, that would stay in Mexico. So would I, <laughs> in a heartbeat. So it's this thing that you know we come here because we need jobs for God's sake. And right now, as we're all talking in the field, we have millions of immigrants with papers, without paper, for papers who are out there in the field picking our food so we can eat. Talk about heroes when nobody talks about, I talk about them, the immigrants have been amazing. So I'm very proud of them. Yeah, the, the idea of essential worker and how we, how we express the value to those workers is something that um, definitely needs to be discussed more. Um, Alex or Professor Suji, do you have um, anything you wanna contribute um, about the communities in Chicago? Um, yeah, so something that we've done a lot at Chicago Hopes for Kids this summer is really taking our staff and our AmeriCorps members and learning about Chicago. Um, I think anytime you're going to serve a community, it's very important to learn about that community and why that community looks the way that it does. Um, and redlining is a huge factor of that. We know that Chicago was heavily redlined. That's why the South and West Side look different than the North Side. And we know that race plays a factor in that. Um, I think gentrification is something that we're seeing happening as well. Um, first, typically to Latino communities and then to our black communities. Um, and that has a lot to do with race and how people understand um, what it means to live in a certain community. And I think that's something that like, I'm definitely interested in knowing more about and wish I knew more about, um, but definitely have to look at, you know, what happened once folks were here, what kind of jobs were they were they offered, what kind of housing were they offered. Um, I think looking at the redlining, meaning segregated, redlining, meaning um, just like the government or real estate agencies really placing very specific policies on who could live where. Um, and so Beverly is a community that was heavily redlined um, and is now pretty integrated um, for a community that was redlined historically because of one realtor who said, I'm going to bring black families into this community um, and his house was set on fire. So it's not something that's easy. Chicago has a very nasty history of redlining. Um, and it's definitely something that I wanna look a lot more into um, when you're analyzing why communities look the way that they look. Um, it's important to look at the opportunities that they were offered. And I think that is one way that I've seen solidarity um, and just the way that, especially during COVID communities have come together to beautify each other's communities or to repair some of the stores that were damaged. Um, so yeah, definitely interested in more about that. Great, uh, Professor Suji, did it look like you might have something that you wanted to say something? Oh, you're muted, sorry. Here we go. Oh, no. You were unmuted for a second, then now we can't hear you. You can't mute yourself. It's hard to unmute, but then you mute yourself. So I'm going to be unmuted the whole time. That works. Mute. 
There we yeah. now we can. There hey, we go. Hey, wonderful, hey. the wonderful parts of Zoom. <laughs> um, so um, I'm at, I was actually this morning just teaching my students um, the book um, Drake and Caton's Black Metropolis and just unpacking how. Um, uh, uh, so Drake and Caton's work, as well as Lehman, The Promised Land, talking about the Great Migration North. And how you know redlining was very you know systematized. It was all about keeping some neighborhoods white, right, and preventing African Americans from living anywhere in proximity to whites. And so that book, those books, predominantly look at you know the African American experience. But you're you're absolutely right, Alex. That housing is a major concern. And as um, uh, Massey and Denton have argued in their book American Apartheid. It is the linchpin of race relations in the United States. It's the linchpin of racial inequality. And we know that United uh, that the United States in general, but especially Chicago, is a very, very segregated place. So much so that sociologists refer to our country and our city, or Chicago, as being hyper-segregated. Something like 80% of all Black people would need to move for there to be racial egalitarianism in housing, right? And so housing becomes a central issue for thinking about um, uh, building bridges, um, as well as keeping them intact, right? Like that's what we've seen a lot of happening um, in Chicago. And I love what you said, Alex, about how people are engaging in projects around neighborhoods to, you know, to desegregate and also to improve one another's homes, because this is very, very important. This is central to our lives as Americans and um, to ending racial inequality. No, that's fascinating. That's something that seemingly simple as housing could have such a drastic effect on our society. And of course, it's not that simple. Right. Nothing ever is, right? That's Especially when it involves ending white supremacy and making lives better for people of color. It's always going to be difficult, you know, until one day it will not be. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so I'd like to move the topic forward. Um, to something that Alex started to bring up. The one thing that is ever present in our lives today, uh, internationally um, Black, Latinx, and Afro-Latinx communities are facing the brunt of the COVID-19 pandemic in both public health and economic terms. Uh, what are groups that you, are groups or individuals that you see that are working to care for those who are underserved by the state, not only in their own neighborhoods, but across racial or ethnic lines? Um, Alex, you started to bring up a group that you've worked with. working on the mute. You can't talk. Yeah, there, there we go. Yet like, yeah, it doesn't let you unmute yourself. Um, <laughs> yeah, so the organization that I work with, um, Chicago Hopes for Kids, is an organization that works with youth and families living in homeless shelters. And of course, we know that the majority of folks experiencing homelessness across the nation, and specifically in a city like Chicago, are people of color. Um, we know that folks experiencing homelessness are especially susceptible to contracting COVID because of close living spaces. Um, a lot of our parents are essential workers. You know, a lot, a lot of things that would put them in a position where they would be more susceptible to getting COVID. Um, something that I've really seen in my own work in my organization um, and just other organizations is this newfound solidarity to refunnel volunteers. Um, I think in the nonprofit landscape, it can feel very um, competitive right? You're like you're competing for grants, you're serving the same population. Um, it can be hard to find other folks who do similar work or to work together. I know coalitions like Chicago Coalition for the Homeless has been a really great place for organizations who serve folks experiencing homelessness to come together and really bring together their efforts. Um, but I have just been really impressed with the way that other organizations have funneled their services and volunteers to us, the way that we've been able to redistribute our resources. Um, and I think that that is something that is essential when you talk about solidarity, right? Like being able to redistribute your resources and recognize um, one organization is not gonna be able to, to do all of it. You might not be best positioned to now do the work. Um, we've seen that a lot at our own shelters, right? Previously, folks were able to come in and out of the shelters and volunteer no problem. Now we're having to rely really heavily on folks that are already there or our parents. Um, and so, Having to redistribute how you do the work and who you do the work um, for us has forced us into solidarity. Um, but I think that like 
definitely a silver lining for our organization has been to see that there are a lot of organizations who want to do the same things, who have the same goal, um, and that working together really is the best way to do that. No, and that's like exactly like you said, a silver lining. It's one positive that we can take from this. And it also makes me think of how that's such a common thing that you find in um, Black families or Latinx families. When you are, you have fewer resources, you're always working with the people around you to make them last longer. And that's, that's great that that's what um, that folks are, are doing right now. Um, Carlos, what do you, at the museum, I'm sure you are involved in things or you know of other community partners that are working right now? When I talk to so many people, I think one of the things that we have to highlight is family, how important family has been. But one of the ironic things about COVID is having large families living together has been a major problem, obviously. I live in a building where one time it was my wife, my three kids, and I upstairs, my grandmother and parents downstairs. We have four generations. Now that's very uncommon to a lot of folks. It's very common to us though. And so, but in this COVID crisis, having more people in tight situations, we know now it's not an asset, obviously. But to me, I think the families have played a major part. What I like there is there's so many stories about individuals who, you know, have a friend who has a COVID and they go get them to grocery, leave them outside the house, or they take care of things they need. There's been a lot of that, and that hasn't been in the media a lot. And I think that's very important to tell these, to serve these average ordinary people who help out their friends. I think that's a positive thing we need to talk more about. And non-for-profits have been really amazing throughout this whole process. I mean, they really have gone beyond, beyond everything possible to help out uh, folks. So the role of non-for-profits, to me, I think in this current crisis, should show everybody how important they are. The other thing I want to mention, and, and I think it was brought up a bit already, is in my community, so much of population are essential. Uh, people who are, you know, they have to work. Uh, we have the guys who have, you know, you know, the ice cream carts, the Mexican, you know, guys, they keep working, man. <laughs> they have to keep working, they're not gonna eat. And then the other problem is many people in our community, you know, who do not have, have, you know, the right papers to be in this country, which is absurd. How any human being can be undocumented is the worst curse word you can ever call somebody. We're, we're all human beings, okay? And, but so many people are afraid to even go get help. Simple, you, you know, the census. If I was undocumented, I don't trust Trump. I would not go out and fill out a census form. I wanted to be honest. I think, oh, they're just trying information about me. So even if they want to seek out help, where can you get help? So I think the family and not-for-profits really, really have excelled in this crisis. You know, Carlos, you're making some really great points about the importance of families. Because African Americans, we experience the same types of overcrowded situations, or maybe overcrowding is not even the right word, word because there's this moral judgment involved in it, right? But having multi-generational families, having grandmothers who care for kids and having parents, right? This is, these are all issues that we know are horrible if we're trying to prevent a pandemic, right? So the, this, this is definitely an issue for the African American community as well as being essential workers, right? We know that many African-Americans are also on our frontline workers, whether we're talking about people who are you know, heavily involved in postal work, right? Um, and in other jobs that have been traditionally available to African-Americans, particularly in the public sector. And being Nigerian means, for me, means that many of my family members and members of my community are health professionals. So many of us are, uh, many of countless numbers of my aunties are, you know, nurses. And so we have a lot of concern, uh, concerns about our health, you know. Um, and, I, and I also think about my students. I just got an email today from one of my students who told me that her grandmother passed away. You mm. know, so this is something that's really like heavy hitting for a lot of us, you know, and even like just as being an educator and being in an educator space, you know, we're trying to manage a lot and then getting hit with like students after students who get COVID themselves, who are managing that, whose family members get it, who are trying to have a class, right? But then mom walks past, <laughs> you know, in the background or we hear children in the background. I had one student like holding her baby. So like, this is something that is really, you know, hitting 
communities of color, specifically African American and Latino communities or Latinx communities really, really hard. And we need to recognize that. And I'm glad that there's a lot of, I think it's important to recognize the solidarity and the coalitions and like the work that people are doing in nonprofits and just everyday life, just helping one another. Cause that's the only way we're gonna get through this, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. And when both of you were talking and bringing up um, the term essential worker, kind of made me think about how we can flip that word on both sides of it. So essential worker is someone that we need to work because they're a nurse or they work in a grocery store and the community needs them. But then there's the other side of being an essential worker where you need to work or you can't provide for yourself or your family. So you're essential in the sense that you need to be working. Um, so I think, and that's something that yes, the, the black uh, Latinx, Afro Latinx communities are really are having a, a are struggling with that right now. Mm -hmm. And then coming to working as a community to um, to fight the pandemic. Um, so moving on a little bit, uh, since the spring, we've seen a renewed interest from the media and the public at large in the Black Lives Matter movement and protests against police brutality after the killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, and not only in the U.S., but around the globe. And there are examples of the non-Black Latinx community supporting their Black and, and Afro-Latinx neighbors and other unfortunate examples of further division and colorism. Um, what are some effective ways that we can combat this tension? Um, Carlos, do you have any thoughts? One, I think we really need to make many, many changes. But in the arts world, one of the things I've been talking about forever, and it doesn't make me any friends in the white community, but the reality is that except in the arts world, the problem we have is not the white right, it's the white left. They're the ones who control the arts. They're the ones who discriminate. They're the ones who have all the power. And it's hard to tell them because they don't understand it. They just don't get it, so many of them. And so how do you make changes? So, you know, if we're gonna make change in society, we have to find allies, obviously. And that's what we're talking about. And the white right's the right right, so, you know, I don't know what we can do about them, but the white left has to learn that we don't need to be saved. We don't need, I was on a thing yesterday with someone talking about that they're going to uplift communities of color. What the hell is that? I mean, it's like, it's crazy. So, you know, we have to have them understand that there's racism and they have super advantages because of racism and they should speak up about it. They have to speak up. I think they're a key ally in this whole thing because they have so many power positions and many of them don't want to let go of them. And I think um, this whole thing about, you know, you know, police brutality, well, my concern is this comes up like every 10 years and it goes away. Then something else happens and it goes away. In fact, the COVID, one of the things that COVID really hurt was this whole movement because I think because of COVID, I, if, I should back let's say that if COVID did not exist at the moment, the Black Lives Matter thing would be even more in the front forefront of everybody. And I think that it's, you know, it's been unfortunate that this whole movement's happened now in terms of because we have COVID. I do think that we need to make some, you know, big changes soon because, you know, history teaches me very well that you have the opportunity and if you don't seize it, it goes away. And it's good they're gonna have parks renamed and you know, you know, a lot of these statues that need to go, that's very good, but we need to do much more than that or else we've lost an opportunity. Yeah, and I would add, I think within the Latino community, there's a lot of hesitancy to talk about race because there are members of the, of the Latino community who are white, who are black, who identify as mixed or racially ambiguous. And because of historically how Latinos have been treated in this country, there's this pull between you know, not, not fully accepted as white, but also get like very clearly experiencing these disadvantages that I think make the Latino community very hesitant to talk about race and more so about privilege. Um, and colorism is a very big part of that. I know within my own family, my grandma, favored the lighter skin children over the darker kids. Um, and that's something that is just deeply ingrained in her upbringing and um, that passes on through generations as well. And so I think starting conversations within the Latino community of how 
your race does allow you certain privileges um, and kind of where that fits is very important. And it's very confusing. It's very confusing. In like in Mexico, I am white. It is very clear that I am white in Mexico. In the United States, I'm racially ambiguous, which is confusing, right? Like to some people, I'm white and I have privileges that come with that. And I've heard other things from other people. So it's just a confusing conversation. But I think more importantly, outside of, you know, putting people in boxes that already are socially created constructs is understanding where your privilege lies in that and how that can be used to uplift other people um, or to help create some of that solidarity. So one of the things that I've really um, loved about the Black Lives Matter movement is that we're not waiting for white people to catch on, right? Like, this is a movement that's been around for over a decade, right? Where people, or has it been, no, since 2013, I believe it's when it was founded. So not quite a decade. Um, but there's just this idea that our lives matter, right? And it's women of color, black women who've been at the forefront of it, including I believe an Afro-Latina, right? And so I don't think that, um, I think that struggle and activism have been very, very central for helping us to get to a better place. And maybe with COVID, it would have been, without COVID, it would have been better. Or maybe it would have been worse because there's a lot of people who are not working, who are not going to school, right? So a lot, a lot of the protests happened, you know, right when we were, everything was closing down. So maybe people had a lot more time and energy to go and, and you know, attend movements or, what have, or um, actions or what have you. Um, so I just think that it's important to recognize the important role of activism in all of this. And that even if, you know, our white liberal allies, you know, can talk the talk, but don't necessarily walk the walk. So now you just have to put their feet to the fire. Like, this is not about whether you want to, right? This is about you having to. And perhaps that involves changes in the law. Perhaps that involves publicly shaming. You know, I'm not against, you know, good public shaming to, you know, if it involves ending, you know, racial inequality. But um, these are things that we that are necessary. We have to recognize the role of policy and everyday just kindness, but also activism. These all go together. I was gonna mention, I think it's very important because you know, Alex mentioned about boxes. And I think that's one of the problems we have that we that we're being put in all these kind of boxes. When I go up to Chicago, there were Mexicanos, Puerto Ricans, you know, Guatemalans, we all got along fine. But now we're Latinos, Latinx, Latin before we are, remember, you know, you know, Mexican. That doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, look at Asians. Here's a here's a continent, largest continent in the world, with so many countries, probably over a thousand cultural groups. But they cannot be Chinese or Indian or Pakistani. No, they are first Asian because we are being made so we can be, uh, how should I put it? You know, you know, understood by the white power structure. No, we, you know, we need to be understanding. I mean, and know who we are to us ourselves first and foremost, then let's reach out to everybody else and make them understand. But I think our culture is being, you know, tossed aside everything and, you know, culture is so important. And coming from a country like Mexico, where the culture is so rich to come here and, you know, being boxy, you're this, you're not that. You know, in 19, you know, 64, I was in fifth grade. I had to follow the form, everybody in the class did. And it's, and had to say, you know, who you were. And it said at that time, okay, colored people, Indian, Caucasian, Oriental, and other. There was no place for me. I'm 10 years old. I wrote, you know, Mexican. My teacher freaked out. You can't write in this form's official form. But from that early age, I can see that people are telling me who I am. And Kuta Kinte, remember the story of Roots? The first two things they did to him was they changed his name, right? That's a power thing. You're not Mexican, you're Latino, Latinx, blah, 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 you know, that's who you are. And then you can't speak the language. And that's a power thing too. And we're being told, oh, you know, you know, don't speak Spanish. So I think we need to take that power back and say, this is who we are. And let's us define who we are. That's very, very important. You know, oh, go ahead. You know, I, I love what you just said, Carlos, because it reminds me of like the importance of how we classify ourselves, right? It's not only about how the state and like all these outside forces are saying, okay, check this box. It's also about us saying we want to be 
we want to identify as this, and we're going to force you to do this. And this is why I am really proud of our Afro Latinx like brothers and sisters and like non gender conforming individuals who've been like, I am a black woman, I am black, period, and I'm Latino, and like those things do not have to be in conflict. And who recognize the very real experiences of racism that they experience within their families, within you know jobs, within their home countries, being seen as not authentic you know, Latinx, right? But these are all concerns. And that's why I've been very like happy to see a lot of activism from the Afro-Latinx community around these issues. And that actually moves us a perfect segue into the next question that I had, um, which I wanted to specifically address the Afro-Latinx community. And you started to bring some of this up, Professor. Um, but what are some of the more complicated issues that this community faces? And what are some things that we can do about it? Oh, so I can't, I can't speak for the Afro-Latinx community in the United States because I'm not a member of that community. I would have loved for there to have you know, been a member of that community here on the panel, right? Um, so I am not going to speak for somebody else. Mm -hmm. No, that's, I, yes, I understand that. Um, you just started to talk about it, so I thought, oh, I'm sorry, Carlos? I just mentioned that in the census forms, you know, we're supposed to mark off what race we are and then, you know, what cultural group. Nobody else has to do that. It's ridiculous, these forms. And Actually, everybody has to do that on the census. Everybody has to say no, what, what you look at, no, 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 look at census, the way we are marked, you know, if you go to Wikipedia, look at what we are, where there's white, Hispanic, white, non-Hispanic, Hispanics are choices world, don't give me that word. Uh, but, you know, so, you know, it's, it's crazy that people define who you are. And that is so, so absurd. And that's, to me, a major self-empowerment when we determine if every Mexican in the world went to Mars and I'm the lax Mexican, I'm a proud Mexican. Scotty in Star Trek, he's still Scotty. He's going all over the universe. <laughs> he's still Scotty. There's nothing wrong with that. But, but it's like, if you belong to something, it's so I'm very proud to be a Latino, but I'm Mexican first and foremost. And that's very key. Hey, let me give you an example if you want to relate this. Mexicanos and Puerto Ricans in their whole history have never had anything between the two countries that, that has happened that's been important. None. Then we come to Chicago, the first place where both groups ever lived. And you have a lot of Puerto Rican friends, a lot. But we're supposed to be palsy wowsy and know everything about each other. How? You know what I'm saying? It takes time to learn a community. So, so I do think the one thing we should have to talk about a lot is trust. We need to learn to trust one another and we need to be able to get to know each other. But let every you know, group define themselves and not be boxed in. I think we also just don't see, at least I have not seen in my upbringing, a lot of stories that speak to that intersectionality. Um, like I, I've never read anything about a racially ambiguous Latina who lives in the United States. Um, and so there are these conceptions that people have of like what a Latina should look like or what an American should look like or what an Afro Latina should look like. Um, and it's, I think, I genuinely just think some people just don't know, right? Like there's not that kind of exposure. Um, and so I think offering people the opportunity to one, share how they would like to be identified and what that identity means to them, but then creating a platform or a space for people to share those stories is really powerful. This is the power of ethnic studies, right? And this is the power, I'm proud to be a sociologist representing here because sociologists have been doing a lot of work on how people classify themselves and how people assert an identity, right? Both in the United States and across the Americas. For example, um, one of my mentors is Edward Tejas, who's done a lot of work on Mexican Americans and how they identify here and issues of inequality they've experienced based on a variety of factors. But also, um, I think it's and really, really important to recognize ethnic studies, right? Like, this is something that should be, there should be a Latinx, you know, studies department everywhere, right? Like, I don't know what's going on at UFC. I mean, last I heard, it was a bit of a contentious situation there. But this is why African American studies and Africana studies are, are so important, right? Because then we can learn more about who we are, how we identify and the tensions around those issues and how we you know, get past just you know, questions of identity. I'm not gonna lie, I think identity is important, 
But I'm not really interested in how people think about themselves in their head. I leave that for the psychologist. I'm like, yeah, I'll do that stuff. I'm more interested in what people are doing with their identities, right? How people are, are um, enacting those identities to make lives better for themselves, for their families, for their communities, and for other communities, right? For the people who live around them, who they work with. I think that's the most important thing when thinking about identity, that it's not just like well, what box you check off, but it's who you break bread with, who you hire, who you have your neighbor as your neighbor, right? Thinking about a place like Chicago, my students were shocked to hear about a, a race riot. We use that term so loosely in which five, was it like 5,000 whites descended on a neighborhood because black people had moved into a white neighborhood, right? And that a thousand police officers were needed. And this is something that's happened over and over again in the history of Chicago, right? That my students would not learn except for this one little like Africana studies class, you know? But um, I just, I think these things are very, very important. And I, that's why I love, you know, the activism I'm seeing happening right now with my students, with the young people, because like, things don't change just because we talk, right? Things change because people get angry and they, you know, mobilize their identities to make the world better. No, oh, and I think that's fascinating. And one of the important things I wanted to include in this discussion is not just a lot of theory or have this be something that stays in the proverbial ivory tower. I want this as something that people can take away from them, take away with this and, and think about it later on in ways that they can apply it. And that's fascinating um, that you as a sociologist say like, no, like what, what people, how they use their identities. I wrote that down. I was like, that's really fascinating. Is what, do you, what do you do with your identity? It's not just something that you keep to yourself. What are you, how are you using it to improve your community? So I, I did research with Sylvia Zamora, who's at Loyola Marymount University, in which we looked at Los Angeles as a case study. We looked at different nonprofits there to see how people were either bridging or um, um, uh, incorporating African-Americans into immigrant rights organizing and the, the ways people were successful or a lack of success. And what we found was this notion of space being really important, right? That like, Talking about like, are they taking our jobs? Are they not taking our jobs? That's, that stuff only creates more friction and tension and is not helpful. But thinking about, we all live in South LA and we want our neighbors in South LA to have good jobs and to pay their bills and be able to feed their kids, right? That was much more helpful for um, organizing across color lines or across ethnic lines. And I would love to see more of that happening in a place, a dynamic place like Chicago and other cities, right? Where people are like using this place-based identity. It becomes more challenging because Chicago is so hyper-segregated, right? But this notion of the Chicagoan, could you imagine what, what could, the magic that could happen if we're like, this is our city, we're taking our city and we're turning it into something beautiful, right? And like creating a multiracial, multi-ethnic coalition, thinking about like George Washington, right? Back in the day, right? Like, this is our city and we we want our city to be a place for all of us, right? And not just some. No, and that's important. You know, when we were getting ready for this talk and we were talking about Harold Washington and the importance that he played in our city and then how that can be so much broader as well as, you know, it's, it's something that President Obama has said is his presidency would not have existed without Harold Washington, this mayor from a, mid, you know, a large city in the 80s. Um, which what he was elected due to solidarity between the, the Black and Latinx communities. So that's, that's important. In fact, I want to comment that Harold really, really is the most important person in my community's you know, political history. Because for the first time in the early 80s, because before that it was all machine. It was Daly, it was Bernard, you know, it was Mike Belandic. It was always machine. So, you know, he wasn't much interested in, you know, in that. But Harold did stir up a lot of people. And for the first time, people in my committee were running for state rep, for state senator, for all the person. And it was Harold, he did that. And you're right, a billion percent. If you want to write this about Chicago, African-American politics, it starts with Harold, then Obama's way over here. But it starts with Harold. He did it, he's the man. You know, if an amazing, amazing individual he really was oh so did we clarify who harold washington is because i have a lot of students who are here they're from new jersey and they're like who is this okay. person you're talking about <laughs> christina you started to explain who he was a little bit oh carlos 
Oh, Carlos became mayor in 1983, the first African-American mayor in Chicago's history. He won again in 87 in March, and he passed in November of that year. So he never had a chance for a second term. But he really, and I mean, I know you, you know, because I was a young person at the time, many years ago, and I can tell you, no matter where you were at, people weren't talking about the Sox or the Cubs or the Bears or the Blackhawks or the Bulls. They were talking about, my God, look at this. He may do it. We can help him do it. We're going to have a voice. You just had that energy that you just cannot describe. And I've not seen that energy since then, to be honest with you. Obama didn't do it. No, it was Harold who really did that energy in which you really, and you know what? He was Harold. He wasn't Mayor Washington. Of course we knew he was the, he was the mayor, but he was Harold. You can go up and talk to him. I remember, you know, he'll come to our neighborhoods for like Fiesta the Soul and all the grandmas are making the food. Harold, come try mine. No, come try He'll try everybody's food. He was like part of your family. He really did do so much for both communities having a chance to work together. Oh, and that's a really fascinating history of Chicago and something that most of us talk very proudly of is, is Harold Washington and, and his time in office. Um, do we have anything else we want to add to that? Or we can start to the questions, the Q&A. Okay, so I thought that we would start the Q&A a couple minutes early because someone asked a question that's really similar to the last question I had. So I'm gonna use this person's um, language. Um, and this is, uh, I think we can start with Carlos since you're our resident artist today. Um, but of course, anybody can, can uh, contribute. Um, the question is, how can artists play a role in working with people in their neighborhoods to imagine solutions to these problems? I think artists are playing a key role, not can they, they're already playing. I mean, there's a lot of art being across the city. A lot of artists also work with young folks and that's very, very, very important. Imagine a kid who wants to play with, you know, but then he's a ball player and he could play with a Chicago ball player or, or work with a Chicago White Sox player. To be able to work with, with an artist at a young age is so crucial for that development of that young person that they know they can go out to, and do something. And one thing about the art, I always say this about the artist, I'm not an artist, I'm an arts administrator. I have no artistic talent, <laughs> no, none, nada, okay? But I was just say, when, when an artist does the work, now, now if it's a painting, if it's a dancing, it's theater, in essence, they're putting their soul out there. They are, they are like, here is who I am. It takes a lot of courage to do that in a sense. And I think, they can lead by example in so many ways. And having more artists in the schools, you know, we have tons of artists that we pay to go to schools. I think having artists be in the schools as much as possible will be a great, great, great step forward. No, yeah, that's interesting. I, oh, go ahead, Alex. Oh, sorry. I was just going to add, um, so our organization is doing a lot of work with children living in homeless shelters, specifically trying to help get through e-learning. Um, and art is one of the ways that allows for a lot of people to release some of those emotions or really process what they're feeling. And I think right now that school, um, which is a safe space for a lot of our students, is not an option. Art is a really great way to offer students that vehicle for processing some of those things in a way that's private. Um, that's where I've really seen art play a big role in the work that we do, just allowing a family to color or to create something that they don't need to put on display or say out loud, like, hey, this is why I made this, but they know and they can look at it and say, I made that. Um, and I think making art accessible um, is something that like we're very passionate about as an organization, but also I've seen a lot of organizations such as Sky Art really come together during COVID and provide supplies um, to families because art can be accessible. Um, and we know that there are certain types of arts that are very accessible. And then there's a lot of art that you kind of need a lot of supplies. Um, and so I would say opening both of those things to students is a really great way that artists can come together and help support during this time. You know, I want to add something too. When I first started the museum, you know, you know, the buzzword back then is arts are important, essential to the human experience. A few years went by and then the talk was arts are an economic engine. We all became capitalists <laughs> in the arts world. It's about the money, baby. And I began saying years ago, 
the arts are essential to democracy. And people in the arts will look at me, are you crazy? Go, wait, you're crazy. Don't you know what's going on in this country? The arts are really essential to democracy. And now I'm hearing more people talking like that. And I think this is the time we arts are essential to democracy. Because the democracy, you know, we, you know, we don't have, you know, you know, you know, a creeping fascism in this country. We have galloping fascism at the moment. And the arts is one sector that is fighting that. That's very, very important to say. No, those, those are all important points. And it's so interesting to talk about young people and students when unfortunately art programs are usually the first things cut from school budgets and the public school system, you know, when we look at our city in Chicago is so fraught and, but no, it, it is, art is, is such a wonderful conduit for, for all of those things and activism included. Um, another question that we had that I thought was um, really fascinating uh, we've talked a lot today about the diversity in our in communities, whether that be the Black, Afro-Latinx, Latinx communities. There's a lot of diversity. We know there, it's not a monolith. It's something that um, you know pundits like to talk about is the Black vote or the Latinx vote. But it, there's a lot of diversity within all of those communities in the way people identify themselves. And while it's important to maintain your your culture and your identity. What's a way of striking a balance between maintaining your culture or identity while also embracing the diversity between in your community or amongst communities um, to to improve um, improve things for your community? You know, the African American vote in South Carolina propelled Joe Biden. Nobody votes as well and as how should I put it um, uh, focus. Is Afro American community. I wish we were there, but we're nowhere near there. And part of it is because of the diversity of our communities. That that is an issue. Well, you know, you know, Cubans have always voted more to the right, overwhelmingly in the history of the country. You know, so I do think when you talk about the Latino vote, there is no such thing as an average Latino person the way they're going to vote. There isn't. In the Southwest, it's much more conservative. And another thing that no one talks about is, and I'm not knocking it, but this is what it is, the born again movement that's going on in the Mexican community in the Southwest, those people, once they're converted, become Trump followers and become very conservative. And so I, I don't know how the African American community has been able to have a diverse range of spirituality, but still vote as a block. My hats are off. I wish we can do that. But it is a problem because you know, when, 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 when Trump got like 25%, some people said 20%, some people said 20%, some said 29% of the Latino vote, he didn't even get 100 of a percent for God's sake. But that's part of the issue about the diversity, you know, you know that we have. So, so we're not this monolith, we all walk and talk the same. We don't, so <laughs> we don't. It's really interesting what you said about evangelicals because it reminds me of um, how 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 impactful evangelicals have been in the Brazilian context as far as being highly influential for having their own version of Trump, like their Bolsonaro elected, and thinking about like how um, in the. For, from what I understand, there's been a lot of like black evangelicals also being very um, very engaged in contentious politics, although like maybe they wouldn't refer to it in that way, right? Just a lot of like anti-white like anti supremacy activism, right? But using the, le the lens of the Christ follower, right? Using the lens of evangelicals to fight for the rights of Afro-Brazilians. So it's, I think we, one thing that really bothers me both personally as a Christian woman, but also as a, a social scientist is how the media often depicts um, white evangelical, or it depicts evangelicals as all white, right? There's always this discussion of evangelical Christians, a Christian, you know, um, vote, and so wait, wait, wait what, what Christians are we talking about here, right? Because when we listen to black people, we see tons of Christianity, you know, in the African American community and black communities that are that don't align with these 
traditional notions of what even and then the evangelical vote looks like, right? So I think it's really important to tease apart and to challenge particularly the media and how it's depicting evangelicals because it's, it's, it's highly problematic and it erases the experiences and the diversity within the church. And it, you know, Carlos is really interesting what you're saying about like, the diversity of the Latino population. Because of course you got people coming from people who are who for whom the border crossed them, right? But they didn't cross the border. You got people who were colonized, right? And like you are now part of this entity. And it's like, wait, who are you? Right? You got other people who like have migrated and who've migrated from very, very different places, who are indigenous, speak indigenous languages, speak Spanish, speak even Portuguese, right? So thinking about a Latino vote gets just really, it erases a lot of what it is to be you know, Latinx in the United States and just Latinx in general, but also like the black vote, right? Divorcing it from the Christian vote is also problematic. So I think that, you know, I think it's a lot about the media and how it's just, you know, erasing all of those intricacies. And I don't want to say nuance because it's not even nuance, it's just accuracy. Right. It's just not being very accurate and um, ex in explaining exactly what they're talking about. Well, that's what you're, yeah, it's what you're thinking is, is um, engaging the media more and explaining that um, there is a lot of diversity in these communities. Um, that's what you're saying is important. But you know, we need to be careful how we identify because let me give you an example. This person told me this story years ago. It's about, you know, 40, 50 years ago, a white woman in New York decided to do a study on Latina women. But she decided to do a Latina woman in the suburbs. <laughs> and of the 20 people she interviewed, nine were the former from Argentina. And Argentina and Argentines are, a lot of them are Italian, they're German, <laughs> they're Spanish, there's not a lot of, you know, indigenous African blood, you know. And she used that data to interpret New York that is always at the highest percentage of Afro-Latinos. So all because we speak Spanish, we have to understand that our genes don't speak Spanish. So even when you talk about, you know, you know, Latino health, you have to be very careful when you use that term because we are just so diverse. And that's important, like thinking about who is this white woman who is writing about Latinas, right? Like we, we are seeing in the media right now that white women can do a lot of damage to our communities, right? When they try to speak for us. Right, thinking about that. Or try to act as if they are a member of the community as exactly. we're seeing in George Washington right now. Exactly, exactly. So we have to be very, very careful about people who claim to speak for us and to do you, you know, take these opportunities to do research on our populations and say, yeah, like I'm one of you. And yeah, I'm, you know, what did what she say? She's like, La Bombalera, I'm not even gonna say her name. You know, La Bombalera, right? And we have to be very careful of people who do research on us. And we have to question like what their intentions are and their findings and, you know, social science is the name, their methodologies. Like what is your population size or your sample size? Who are you representing? How did you get, gather your data? I wanna know all of those things. And we need more people of color, people from underrepresented minorities in academia, we need more black profs, you know, we need more brown people, we need more, you know, Afro-Latinas, we need more Latinos in universities to teach and to do the research, to get the big grants, so we can know more about our peoples and how to make life better for our peoples, as opposed to, you know, giving opportunities to those who are co-opting our cultures or to whites who are claiming to speak for us and do research on us, like, there needs to be more activism within academia so that we can tell different stories and do do better for our communities. No, that's so important and something that higher ed is is constantly grappling with is how to really make it true that to elevate those voices. One of the papers that I was reading when I was doing research to prepare for this was about um, the Latinx community in the United States and all of the authors were men and none of them were Latino. So it's, it's that, it's like, I, I opened it, I looked at that and I was like, well, this is not good research. I'm not, I'm not reading this. But look, so. look at the terms we even use, higher ed. Let me tell you, as a person who worked at Chicago Public Schools for, for 13 years, you get me a good grade school teacher. I don't care if you thought at Harvard University for a billion years, that grade school teacher is worth their weight and go. But see, it's like, oh, you're just a grade school teacher. It's not higher ed. So this vocabulary needs to be, changed completely 
it, it's just so crazy. It's crazy. No, absolutely. You're right. And that's something that I should be mindful of. And we should, all should be is, you know, we talk about professors and the people doing research, but it all the way goes down to who are the teachers instructing our children. And overwhelmingly they're, they're white. They're, they're the majority. They're not the, the minority. They're not, they don't come from the minority communities where they're teaching. Yes, I believe Ch Cesare Warren has done some really important research on this, looking at white um, teachers um, who teach in underprivileged, quote unquote, you know, neighborhoods and schools, and how a lot of them are white women teaching black and brown kids in places like Chicago, right? So this is this is really important, like thinking about not only who's teaching people in, you know, universities and producing knowledge, but also who's training and teaching our children, and how colorism might be something that's not only learned within our communities, right? But it's also being reinforced within the classroom setting. Absolutely. Alex, do you wanna wrap us up with this? I thought you looked like you had something oh, to say. Yeah, I was just gonna say, that's why I love working with students. Um, I think like the best way that someone can, you know, work with someone that they don't identify with is by finding ways to put them in the driver's seat because um, they are the knowledge holders and, that's why I'm so passionate about storytelling is because for a lot of high school students that I've worked with, storytelling or some kind of platform provides them the opportunity to drive the conversation, to drive the activities. Um, and then on the topic of teaching, I think it's also just like teaching is not a very accessible profession. Um, you have to be able to afford to be a teacher, unfortunately. Um, and that I think is something that's even more deeply problematic and we see a lot of similar things with nonprofit. Um, if there there is an economic disparity and who can afford to be a nonprofit. Um, and so I think that's something that we need to address as well if we want to see more educators or leaders in spaces where we have black and brown students, um, we have to make that accessible to those communities. And then also talk to our kids about teaching and nonprofit as professions that are valuable. Um, I know, I think a lot of students when they're just excelling academically, they're told like, oh, you need to be a doctor, you need to be a lawyer, you need to have this, you know, job that's going to provide you all this money and prestige. And there is a lot of prestige and value in teaching and nonprofit work um, and in doing research. And I think talking to kids about the accessibility piece of that, of like, yeah, that is something that you can do um, is important if we want to see those kids in those spots one day. No, absolutely. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to pass uh, the baton back to Saida um, to wrap up for us. Unmute her. Waiting. Yes, there we go. <laughs> Hello. Thank you so much. Listen, I think I can speak for the entire like bunch of participants. I guess I can say audience. It's, uh, it feels really weird when we're over Zoom to call us the audience, but I was looking in the chat and I think we were all quite blessed. You all dropped some gems on us and we just very much appreciate you being here. Christina, as a moderator, you made this go so smooth. Thank you for getting to the audience questions and everyone on in the audience, thank you for joining us for this discussion. Thank you for your thoughts in the chat, for keeping the entire thing engaging, for asking the questions. And again, I did drop the links for um, Dr. Osuji's book, for um, you to check out Chicago Hopes for Kids and please check out the National Museum of Mexican Art, check out those links and join us back for more riveting discussions sometime soon. I realized I never said my name. I am Saida Cavill. I work at the University Community Service Center. It's lit, check us out too and thank you. Uh, the the um, review for the event too is also one of the links in the chat if you can yes, all let you. us know. Please hit that link. It's there again, thanks to Candice evaluate us and we love you wonderful thanks alex thanks professor and carlos we loved having you thank you for me. the panelists were great and um, when i look at the chat the questions i try to answer as many as i could thank you for having me it's been my pleasure guys lovely spending time with you guys this afternoon yeah thank you and alex you're young that means I hate you, but you're our future and you're going to do well. I know you are. So keep Thank at you. it. <laughs> keep at it. Thank you.